Hello and welcome to The Rally Point with Dominic Fielder, author of the King's German series and myself, Rob McLaren, author of the Jobert series. Hello, Dominic Fielder. Uh, hello, Rob. How are you? I'm superbly well, sir. Superbly well and delighted to be here with our, our friends who uh, enjoy catching up on the Napoleonic period. Now, everyone, we're recording the first 30 minutes of the gathering, but once the recording is over, we remain online as our conversation continues. And this month, we'd like to welcome Gareth Glover to Rally Point. Gareth is a Napoleonic uh, specialist, a prolific uh, uh, producer of books uh, derived from uh, Napoleonic memoir, The British Experience, and, and uh, Gareth is based in Wales. Gareth, welcome. Dominic, over to you. Yeah. Uh, hello, Gareth. Gareth, we were talking beforehand um, about your um, the, just the quality and the quantity of your work. And you blithely mentioned just now 118 books. Yeah. The latest one, uh, the British deployment in Portugal, 1796 to 1802, a, a topic that had completely passed me by. So I'm really looking forward to what you have to uh, tell us about this. But afterwards, I've got a few questions I need to try and sort of pin you down on so yep so can you if you do your presentation we'll uh, we'll we'll get to the questions at the end this all started i i get caught in rabbit holes all over the place because when i sort of get into these different memoirs and everything else things come up and it takes me down these holes to find things that i don't know anything about and i didn't know anything about the british deployment in portugal and how big it was and why it was there or anything uh, but let's talk about it a bit so hopefully says having said that no the actual screen is not moving why are you not moving oh there we are right okay so <clears throat> this is the book that started it all off um i found online a book being sold original obviously of general simon fraser who was actually in the uh, portuguese garrison they're actually running it for quite a while his his different sort of um uh, orders etc that were produced etc from 1798 through to 1802. So we're well, having got it, uh, crowdfunding it, and we're giving it to the National Army Museum in London once I uh, once they take it over in a couple of months' time. Um, it got me looking into what was it all about. And actually, it might be quite interesting. We talked about wargaming a little bit earlier on, and there are some possible unusual ideas that maybe will take you somewhere that you hadn't thought about before and some scenarios to think about. So we'll bring it up. But let's cut, cut, let's go back to the start very quickly. Right at the start of the wars against France where after the revolution, Spain was on the Allied side. It was a, a, a royalist country and obviously didn't want to see royalists, uh, uh, the royal families being destroyed across Europe. So it obviously fought against the French. Uh, and there was a series of uh, incursions both ways across the Pyrenees uh, during 1793, 1794. Uh, which involved, as I say, quite a number of armies. Uh, the Spanish had a little bit of success at the start, but it certainly started going wrong in 1794, and the French started crossing into Spain. Uh, but also the Spanish were obviously involved in the uh, Allied uh, takeover of Toulon when they were asked to take it over, where, of course, Napoleon starts his career uh, in sort of managing to drive the fleet out, etc., with his artillery. Um, so we start off the wars with the Spanish on a, against the actual French, and therefore the Iberian P Peninsula is not seen as an area that is going to have any problems with it for the British. But after the Second Battle of Boulou, uh, which is towards the end of April into early May, uh, two-day battle, uh, the Spanish were forced back well across the border and the French were moving down towards the Ebro. Um, at this point, the Spanish decided that let's, uh, let's have a, a treaty with France instead of actually uh, fighting them. Uh, they didn't want to lose Spain, obviously, to the French. Uh, so they signed some treaties. Now, it is often stated that um, that the uh, if you read most histories, San Il Defonso is actually mentioned as being the, the treaty which actually 
uh, brought Spain and France together as allies. It did, but there was a previous treaty which actually finished the war, as you can see on there. Now, this, uh, so the, these treaties, sorry, boy, I went back. Uh, the, these treaties, first of all, stop the actual fighting and they have a peace. The second one, which is the San Il Defonso, actually brings them together in war against Britain and her allies, uh, who were obviously still fighting for the royalist cause as such in Europe. Now, this suddenly changes things because suddenly there is the potential for a French army to enter the, uh, Spain with their allies and the Spanish and the French possibly invading Portugal. Obviously, Portugal is now on the front line. Portugal, as we know, has been uh, linked to um, to the British ever since the 1300s when uh, King John I of Portugal married into the uh, Lancaster family. Uh, this meant that obviously the Portuguese looked to the British for help and the British obviously felt that they needed to give help to actually ensure that there was no in Spanish invasion of Portugal. So therefore, they started considering about coming to Lisbon themselves in 1796. And this is exactly what happens. So, and I'll just show you this first. The, the first thing is they have discussions and it's actually arranged, which is quite unusual and very different to the Peninsular War, is that the British are going to provide troops to persuade, dissuade the uh, Spanish from coming. But at the same time, the Portuguese are relied on to completely supply depots, barracks, all their horses for the cavalry, hospitals, and all victuals and stores uh, and, and forage, etc. So at the end of the day, the, they're being fed and watered by the Portuguese, and they are reliant on them and their com commissariat to do that, which is very different to what we see later on. Um, I've just mentioned this briefly, the, this picture. This is actually Lisbon in the distance across the water there. This is actually Almada, uh, and if you know the lines of Torres Vedras, there was a fourth line on the lines of Almada. Well, Almada was a walled town, as you can see, on, on the southern side of the Tagus. And this is uh, the only really good view I've ever come across it. So I just share that. Now, the first person to get involved with this is General Sir Charles Stewart. Uh, now, he had been the Colonel of the 26th Foot, but he had been in Corsica in 1794, uh, had great quarrels with uh, Hood, the Admiral, and basically uh, sort of gave up and sort of went home, basically, um, and sort of left the troops there to sort of um, get on with it with the with Hood. Um, so that he was seen as being a, a bit of a quarrelsome chap, uh, but he was sent out to Lisbon to command the troops. Uh, he actually, two years later, he moves on to Menorca when the British take Menorca off the Spanish and use that as a naval base. Uh, now, you'll notice that he is a general, but the Portuguese uh, senior officer of all is Marshal General the Duke de Fons. This causes a problem because he is actually superior to Stuart and can actually order him and his troops into action. And the British don't do anything about this, unlike what they do later when Wellington, etc. goes there and they actually make sure they've got the, the, the senior commander, should we say. Now, the troops that were going to go there, uh, I, I won't go through it in great detail, but you can see here, there's quite a lot of troops here. Now, when it says this is actually come from a, a re return I've managed to find in London, uh, the numbers of the troops are questionable. They're what they think the, the troops have at this stage is not actually out of some sort of uh, returns is what London thinks they've got. Uh, and where they say Corsica, in fact, after Corsica uh, is given up by the British, um, most of these troops, where it reads Corsica, you should read Elba because they moved to Elba and it's from Elba they then eventually move later on, as I'll discuss. OK, but that's where they come. There are a couple of units here you may not have heard of, uh, obviously outside the British ones, but you've got things like Smith's Corps, I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, the Maltese cannoneers and French cannoneers, I'll mention that, and the French chasseurs, etc., and Rotalia's uh, artillery. There's a number here and the and the the emigre regiment at the bottom here. I'll go through that a little bit more in a short while now. But as you can see, nearly 7,000 troops being sent. 
This is at the time when Britain was very, very short of troops. This is actually quite a serious uh, number of troops to be sending. Uh, they also have got the 26 Light Dragoons being sent from the West Indies, but they're going to take a while to get there. So it's going to go over 7,000 by the time they arrive. So a serious deployment. Now, just to sort of mention how these arrive, the first to arrive with Stuart in the December is actually some of the emigre troops that have been uh, set up. They're all on the Isle of Wight in uh, UK. Uh, it, they were kept away from mainland UK because they didn't. Uh, they, the British public didn't want French troops anywhere near themselves, so they they actually kept them on the Isle of Wight out of the way. Uh, but these troops were embarked and sent across. So you've got uh, the artillery and three regiments, uh, Mortimer, uh, Castries and Shastri. Uh, you can see pictures here of Mortimer and uh, Shastres who actually ran the two. Uh, Castries is the third regiment. I've not yet found a picture of him. And if anybody can find a picture of Castries anytime, please let me know, email me, because I'd love to have him as well. Uh, but as you'll notice, I've put against Shastres, uh, the Loyal Emigrant Regiment, because that was his other name. And I think quite often it was called that uh, because Shastres and Castri looked a little bit too close for most British people to actually uh, realise they were different units. Now, this is an idea of the type of uniforms they wore. Some of these I was, wasn't able to find, but you can see the Loyal Emigrants on the left uh, as an example. Uh, these had all been set up in 1793 and 1794, but Castries and Mortimer were actually not really French troops. They were more German, uh, French officers generally, uh, but mostly Germans. The loyal emigrants, however, were mostly French and French uh, soldiers as well as officers. Uh, and Rotalia's infant, uh, artillery sorry, were also formed, but some of those even came from Frenchmen at Toulon, interestingly. Uh, but these are the sort of troops, and that's a, a picture of Rotalia's artillery at the back there. Now, when this, uh, the other lot of troops to arrive didn't arrive till the 21st of June. So for the first six months, you only had those uh, French troops there for Stuart. Uh, but then another 3,500 troops plus 311 women and 320 children arrive from Elba. Uh, and I'll give you a list of what came across in a while, but it's quite interesting to notice that the Dirol and Dillon uh, regiments were actually very poorly thought of. In fact, um, Stuart actually wrote home at this time to say that these, he, the, in the course of my service, I have never beheld two regiments more disgraceful to the British name than the regiments of Roll and D Dillon. And in consequence of this opinion, I've sent Simon Fraser, who is actually obviously who we're talking about with the book, uh, immediately to inspect them. Uh, it is interesting to see that Fraser must have done quite a good job with them and his officers because uh, later on they get very good comments made. Uh, but at this stage, it's interesting that they've been in Corsica and they've been in Elba, and yet Stuart thinks they're the worst troops he's ever seen. So you can hear, see the troops that have now arrived. <coughs> This is actually the British starting to arrive, uh, 12 Light Dragoons and three regiments of foot, some artillery. And then you've got these other emigre regiments that have, uh, oh, and units that have come with them. Uh, and I'll say I'll mention some of these in a minute now. One of the ones I will mention is French Chasseurs. Very strange unit. unit. Um, Castres and, and Chasseurs regiments had a single company, and when I say company, probably about 40, 50 men maximum, um, of these chasseurs. And this seems to have been a strange organisation, which appears from the letters that come back from, uh, from Lisbon to London at the time, as being basically French army officers who can't get an actual command in the emigre regiments because there's too many of them, formed into a company and actually told to serve as ordinary soldiers, as light, light troops. So you can imagine you've got Colonel this and you've got Major this and sort of Captain this type thing, all being told to wear an ordinary soldier's uniform and actually uh, act as, as chasseurs. As you can imagine, this doesn't go well. Um, this actually, they end up sort of uh, spending most of their time arguing about, uh, do you know how, you know, what I was as a, previously and how important I am, etc. Um, 
and therefore these chasseur units uh, seem to have been more trouble than they're worth. And in fact, I think half the paperwork I found of the thousands of pages I found had something to do with problems with the chasseurs. Uh, but there were a couple of things I'd mentioned. I did say about Stuart's Union Regiment. Now, that's what his proper name, which was actually mentioned in there. Um, it was actually set up in Corsica. Obviously, Corsicans joining it uh, with Captain George Smith of the 25th Foot. So he actually, it became Smith's Regiment. Um, but the problem was when they moved to Elba, most of the Corsicans didn't want to go. And therefore, you had huge numbers of them deciding to uh, move themselves away from the regiment quite quickly before they left. Uh, so the numbers were quite heavily down. Um, and even in Elba, a few decided not to carry on either. So by the time they arrived in uh, Portugal, uh, we don't know the numbers because it gone from about 654, probably down to a handful. Uh, and they were incorporated into the British regiments there. So um, these few Corsicans that were left actually became British soldiers. At the same time, the Maltese and the French cannoneers, and I mentioned there was Maltese there, uh, some Maltese troops were delivered to, um, to Toulon when they were actually in the process of trying to defend the place. These Maltese troops uh, then were incorporated with the French cannoneers into this sort of organisation which came across to Lisbon as well. Delon's regiment was uh, reduced to one battalion and all the spare officers pensioned off and got rid of. Uh, and Stuart spent a lot of time in actually weeding out the rubbish, basically, to so make sure that he had good officers, uh, which probably helped with the improvement in the regiment. And I said, and the two companies of chasseurs were reduced to one. Uh, they were still a problem, but only half the problem. Now, let's have a look at who else we're talking about. Obviously, you've got... Prince Regent John, because the Prince Re we have a Prince Regent in both Britain and Portugal at the time, because uh, their parents are actually not too compassmentous. Uh, and you have Juan Carlos uh, de Silva, who uh, the Duke of La Foice, who is actually the Marshal General of the Portuguese Army, all of his 80 years. Uh, so at the end of the day, he's not a man who's going to be out there uh, leading the troops from the front, let's be honest. Uh, but he had senior command and was senior to Stuart. On the other side, the Spanish, obviously you've got King Charles and you've got Manuel Godoy, uh, who later gets the name of the Prince of Peace, etc. Uh, but um, <sighs> Godoy, he actually isn't a great general, but what I would say is he's certainly nobody's fool, really. And if you actually read some of his work, he actually knows what he's talking about to some extent. He may not agree with what he says, but he knows what he's trying to do. Um, he's not an idiot, which he sometimes gets portrayed as, um, but he certainly neither has not really got much military back, uh, background either, uh, although he actually decides to command the troops later in the War of the Oranges, which we'll talk about. Now, this is General Urrutia, uh, who actually was given command of the Spanish troops at this time, and a Spanish uh, force was brought together at Badajoz or that area of Badajoz. He was an engineer by trade uh, and he'd actually been in the siege of Gibraltar and he'd actually been with Cashin the Great during the wars in uh, against the Turks. So um, he actually uh, was, you know, quite an old man again. He was in his 60s by now. Um, but in fact, he fell out with Godoy a couple of years later and was relieved of his duties and Godoy took over himself. But he is the, in, in 1796, when Stuart arrives, this is the man he is facing. Now, I've talked a bit about the fact that we've got the Spanish troops threatening from Badajoz. They're now starting to build up a great number of men there. However, Stuart has two other major concerns about the defence of Portugal, beyond the fact that the Portuguese army are not particularly in the best state to actually defend anything. Uh, it's a great fear that either the French will send a naval force from Brest up in, uh, in France uh, down to actually land uh, near Lisbon and attack Lisbon uh, from the rear. That was a, a major concern of his. The other concern was the Brest fleet uh, could land troops around Ferrol and La Coruna, and they could march down to Tui, which is actually on the border, 
I mean, I don't know how many of you know, any Brits on here would know TUI is over here these days is a travel company. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a fortress called TUI on the border of north border of Portugal. So he was actually concerned about three different scenarios of a, a, the invasion or even all of them at the same time. So what does he do? Well, let me just talk about, first of all, I was mentioned about the Barajos sort of numbers coming together. You can see quite significant numbers. These are actually from reports. Uh, it is quite clear the British were very good, even at this stage in Portugal and Spain, of actually paying informants to give them very good information about what's going on on the other side of the border. And there are lots of reports from all of the major uh, ports of the Spanish and sort of their capital and any military units, etc. And they're getting a very regular reports. Uh, and, you know, you, you're getting stuff like this where in Badajoz uh, in, in 1797, within 30 miles of Badajoz, obviously they didn't want to have them all in the city because, you know, they would run out of food rather quickly. But 31 battalions of infantry, you know, it's, it's significant. 22 squadrons of cavalry. And supposedly up to 4,000 artillerymen already there with another 1,000 ordered to join and 186 cannon battering train plus 100 horse artillery guns. Now, if this is all true, that is a huge force. In fact, they didn't take that that much forward. They, they, certainly the infantry and the cavalry is certainly close to the mark. I think the artillery bit may just, just be a little bit over the top. But at the end of the day, there was a significant force being built up on that uh, on that edge of the border and therefore was a major concern to the Portuguese and to Stuart. At the same time, we have the issue of the entrance to Lisbon Harbour. And you can see by the two blue arrows, there are two approach channels, the major channel and a, a, a lesser channel on the left. Now, the lesser channel goes very close to Fort St. Julian, you can see on the coast there. So therefore, you don't go close to it. So it's the main channel most ships will go down. But in fact, the actual Fort de Bougie, uh, or, or Bougio, uh, which is his correct name, uh, in the channel there, on a little island in the channel, and Fort St. Julian had a crossfire across the entrance, but they literally didn't have that many guns. And Fort Bougio was not that well armed. Um, Fort Bougio, in fact, the Portuguese had finished building it with a parapet for the gunners only knee high. So therefore, they had literally no um, cover from any fire that came in towards them. Uh, so then for the, the uh, Stuart or the British engineers to arrange for the parapet to be raised to five foot high and a 16 inch thick wall uh, to ensure they've got some cover. He also armed it with 14 24 pounders and six mortars, etc. He put gunboats in the channel and he also put four floating batteries into the channel between the two forts with each of them armed with four 24 pounders uh, to actually ensure that uh, and the, with the ability to use red hot shot so that therefore you end up with this situation where you have uh, a, a huge crossfire, making it very difficult for the uh, French fleet to actually enter. And if they did enter, as you can see further up, you've got Bellum Castle and Al Almada on the coast there, which could actually batter them as well. So it was going to be very difficult for the French fleet to actually come into it and actually land and do anything. And and it, further around towards Cascais on the left there at the bottom of the page, um, it's too rocky a coast, you can't do anything there. So they would need to come into the entrance of the Tagus to land. Uh, so he was trying to make sure that that was impossible and one one of the possibilities was out of the way. Now we talk about the third one, coming from the north, from Ferrol, and coming down through Spain. This is actually Tui Fortress, as it is today, looking over the Minho River, which is the border with Spain, and that's Spain on the other side of the river over there. Um, this is exactly where uh, he feared that they would come. And in fact, there were even plans put in place to have British troops sent up to Tui to bolster the Portuguese to make sure that if the French and Spanish came this way, that they would actually uh, hold the fortress and make it very difficult for them. Uh, it, the British troops never actually went there, but they got very close to it. I'll mention that later. Now, these are the commanders throughout the period. Uh, 
we've mentioned Charles Stewart a few times. As you can see later on, there's uh, General Cornelius Kuehler and uh, General Murray Pulteney, both of which were quite senior generals, quite older generals as well. Um, but they, they came in. As you can see, Major General Simon Fraser drops in in between uh, until he becomes a lieutenant general. And then when he becomes a lieutenant general, he takes over the last two years himself and is in command as well. So he, he's there as second most of the time, and, but he stays throughout the entire period. Uh, and again, if any of you can find a picture of this particular Major General Simon Fraser, this one of Bruch, uh, please let me know because there are lots of photographs out there of uh, images of another Simon Fraser, but it's not this one. Now, once we get past the initial stage of 1797, things start calming down. The, port, the Spanish haven't attacked, the French haven't come. The Brits start thinking, oh, maybe this isn't going to come to anything. And we've got lots of other places we need troops. And they start taking troops away. So in early 98, the 51st foot go off to Ceylon or Sri Lanka as it is today. And then we have these, uh, the first foot going back into England. And then eventually when Sir Charles Stuart, who has gone home in 17, uh, 1797, comes back on his way to court, to Minorca, he comes into the place and picks up and takes away all the British artillery, the 50th foot and De Rolls and Dillon's regiments. Uh, so he's, he, although he didn't think much of them previously, he's now happy to take them with him to actually to Minorca with him, all right? But this now only leaves in Lisbon the émigré regiments we've mentioned uh, and the 12th and the 26th Dragoons who have now turned up. It then becomes a bit of a transit camp, but I won't go through them as such uh, in total, but you can see there's a regular movement of troops through here. Uh, in November, certainly, there were five battalions turned up, all three battalions of the 9th Foot and the, uh, two battalions of the 52nd, for example. But they're on their move elsewhere, but they keep arriving, I think, possibly in a way to actually keep a bit of confusion going for the French and the Spanish, who have probably got spies in, in Lisbon as well. That there are constantly troops coming in, so it's not looking as desolate of troops as perhaps it would have done otherwise. And it, it seems to be that they come in for a month or so and then they disappear again and some others turn up. Um, you may notice there's one called the Cambrian Ranger Regiment. I'll mention that one in a minute. That's just another one that came through on its way to Gibraltar to join the, um, the garrison there. And then in 1801, when the troops pass on their way to actually uh, go out to, uh, they start congregating in Menorca and then they get ready to go out towards uh, attack Egypt where Napoleon has taken his troops. Uh, you can see uh, troops pass through at this stage, but not only that, they also take almost the entire 12th and 26th Light Dragoons, leaving very few British cavalry in uh, Lisbon at this stage. Uh, very few, just a small cadre of both. So you can see small numbers left. Now, I just mentioned, I can't be certain of the uniform here. This is probably the most, most likely because the Fencibles, this is one of the uniforms they particularly like to use, the Fencible uh, regiments. Uh, but the Cambrian Rangers were the only Welsh uh, Fencible regiment that was raised. Uh, they were sent out to be part of the Gibraltar garrison, but they popped into Lisbon for a short while and then were just promptly disbanded like all of the Fencible regiments in 1802. Uh, for those who don't know much about Fencibles, the one interesting thing about Fencibles is although they were like a bit like the militia, etc., um, they were actually raised by ballot and the actual officers had a full commission in the army. Uh, so therefore they were of equal rank and sort of status to officers of any line regiment. Uh, so it, it was an actual proper role for an officer to take up, um, unlike some of the other roles in the militia, etc. Now, with regard to the Spanish, uh, as I said, they've been very quiet for quite a while. Apologies. Um, they've been very quiet for a while, but by 1799, they're starting to be under pressure from uh, the Napoleon's obviously he's, he's not he's only consul at this stage, but at the end of the day, he's starting to the French are starting to put pressure on the Spanish to do something about 
the Portuguese. Um, and as you can see, I won't go through them all, but you can see there's there's lots of things like um, that they, they they originally at Barcelona arrest all the Portuguese ships, but then the, the Portuguese uh, complain and they eventually release them. But there are other things like uh, a declaration by the Spanish to say that if a single soldier of the British troops in Portugal uh, should go from here into the Mediterranean, then Spain would immediately declare war. Now, that is quite clearly a, an attempt to stop the British taking troops from here and taking them towards Egypt, because clearly the French were very worried about the build-up of troops in Menorca and obviously had some real worry that the British were going to attempt to take Egypt back. They were right to worry about it because it happened in the end. Uh, but it's clear that obviously they, there is pressure coming from the French to say to the Spanish, you have to tell them that they, you know, warn them that they can't take troops away, make it difficult for them. Uh, however, by the August, the British uh, British government is definitely writing letters to the uh, officers in charge saying about possibly removing it completely. Uh, and things slowly calmed down with the Portuguese making great diplomatic efforts with the Spanish and they calmed things down. Um, but by 1800, it picks up again. Um, it doesn't help when the Portuguese, um, they sign an agreement with the Russians, uh, basically, which uh, means that they become an ally again of another one that is against the French. Uh, and Spain th uh, throws out another threat, invading, uh, uh, saying that if uh, any Russian soldiers land in Lisbon, then they'll invade again. So there's all these warnings of invasion. Um, there are other things like the Port, uh, you know, Port Britain's telling Portugal that uh, France is demanding money out of the Spanish. The Spanish, as we know, and the Portuguese were getting a lot of their money or treasure coming from the New World in South America. Uh, and therefore, if the Spain was going to have to give a load of money to France, Britain really thought that the Spanish would turn around to Portugal and say, right, we want your money instead. And there's another reason for invasion. Uh, but the Brits were really, really getting frustrated with the Portuguese lack of urgency and, and the lack of belief in the Portuguese that they would really attack. They, the Portuguese always believed that they could get out of it with diplomacy. Um, they had managed it for quite a long time, but and it became a case of they really just didn't believe it would happen. Uh, but then, obviously, there's a huge worry in April when... Um, they find out that there are 24,000 Spanish troops in the north of Spain in Galicia. And they are again worried about the Brest fleet coming with the 16,000 troops that they apparently have on board as well, trying to get out of the harbor. So there's potentially 40,000 troops are going to appear in northern Spain at this time. So there's a continuation of slight escalation and more worry. Now, I said about spies and people being putting stuff out there and there was regular letters coming from all over the place, which are in the files. Um, but there's quite a few letters coming in from a William War. And many of you may have read, uh, there are many uh, memoirs of the wars, but uh, the letters of William War, uh, who actually uh, joined the cavalry, uh, is quite of interest uh, to a lot of people. However, this is not the William War of those Peninsular War letters, because at this stage he'd have been eight, about 16 years old at most. This is almost certainly his uncle, uh, who actually helped run the uh, port business in a Porto, uh, another William. But it's still built up. We've got the Brest fleet finally sails with 16,000 troops on it in July 1800. And this starts a, a complete panic with everybody, as you can imagine. Uh, but the Portuguese immediately decide, oh, it can't be anything. They go, they're off to Brazil. Uh, you know, they're not going to come to us. And in fact, in fact, they didn't come to them at all. Um, but the Portuguese eventually in August get driven mad by the British and eventually start recruiting to bring up their regiments to strength. Many of this, their regiments are at half strength or even worse. So they are starting to do something about that. Um, there is even a letter, which I found very interesting, from General Fraser to London, suggesting that Sir Ralph Abercrombie's troops don't go to Egypt, but they sail round to Lisbon and they march on Madrid. It's an interesting one. Uh, obviously it didn't happen, but 
it's another idea that was being put against around. But there's other worrying rumours. Marshal Berthier is meant to be coming to Madrid. Um, obviously, a very senior officer who actually has uh, Napoleon's ear. Um, that 55,000 troops, French troops, are forming at Irun on the border, ready to advance the Sierra de Rodrigo and work with the Spanish in, a, in an invasion. And eventually, the, 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 the Portuguese actually take uh, 4 million cruzados, which is uh, 450,000 pounds in cash, to Napoleon. And there's letters there stating that they actually take it to Napoleon to bribe him personally from actually doing anything in the way of an invasion. Um, it clearly didn't affect what Napoleon was going to do at the time, although nothing happened at this stage. However, uh, it is pretty clear that the money got to him because there are also large numbers of reports saying uh, in the file saying that it has become clear that Napoleon is paying off all his debts in Paris uh, and it's all being paid in cash. So it's, there seems to be quite a good idea that he took the money and then, uh, you know, left the Portuguese to it anyway. Then Lucien Bonaparte does arrive as ambassador to Madrid and he starts putting real pressure on the Spanish to do something about everything that's going uh, to do something about Portugal. Uh, and Murat is even rumoured to be coming to lead the French army in Portugal. Now, these are some ideas of the forces that are potentially around. You can see potentially up to 50,000 French coming, plus all of these Spanish already in the area uh, near Merida now, on the uh, not so much Badajoz, they've got moved a bit. Uh, and as you can see, if you look at the Portuguese army on the left, there is a reasonable size army there in theory. The problem is the quality is not there. And half of those men, as I say, in many of these regiments are either brand new or haven't even turned up yet. Um, so there's a lot of work. And as you can see that the auxiliary army, which is what the British army is called in Lisbon, is actually very small at this stage of 4,000. It's not going to make a huge difference uh, to the, the overall numbers, but maybe in quality. The first thing is, which is interesting, is the Portuguese ask if, if the British will allow General uh, Charles Stuart to come back from Menorca and actually take command of the Portuguese army like Beresford does in 1809. Uh, but the British government declines at this stage. And in fact, the Portuguese go out and uh, appoint a Dane, a General Karl von der Goltz, uh, which I don't know much about. I've got to do a bit of work on him. But this, but what I can say is that the British write about the fact that on his arrival, he really starts to get things organised. And it's the first time they actually feel that the Portuguese are serious about getting their army ready for war, uh, which is of interest. Uh, but the other thing that happens is in January 1801, the entire Portuguese cabinet changes. Now, this has a huge effect on Spain because Spain has many friends in the Portuguese cabinet. And suddenly they've all lost their jobs and non-friendly Portuguese are put in their place. So, again, this actually puts the, uh, the back out of the Spanish. And in fact, by this stage, the Spanish are getting very serious about doing something. And in fact, uh, the French are now seriously talking about sending troops to invade with them. The Portuguese have one last go. They actually go to Paris again and Napoleon demands, as you can see, 100 million francs. That's about 200 million pounds a day. Um, but obviously the Portuguese are saying, well, we can't we can't pay that sort of amount of money. Um, and the negotiations carry on. But while that's going on, uh, reports start coming in of the artillery moving from Seville to Badajoz again. So they'd obviously gone back if they ever went in 1798, but they're on their way back again. And a contract has been signed, they hear, for 6,000 transport mules to be sent to Badajoz, obviously to carry all the food supplies and ammunition and everything else for the army. So there are some serious signs that something's really happening this time. By March, they're finding out that the Ferrol Guard has been doubled and there's still over 23,000 men in Galicia. So there's obviously more concern that the Brest fleet is going to arrive in the north again. Uh, Portuguese troops are ordered by the new, um, 
the marshal in charge to actually to the borders and they go to the Minho uh, and the Alenteo uh, to actually stand by the borders in case of an invasion. And in fact, the loyal emigrant regiment, one of the um, French emigre regiments in the British army, is actually put an, onto ships, Portuguese ships, ready to sail to Oporto and to therefore march up to Tui. Uh, they actually sit on the ships for three weeks and eventually get taken back off again. They don't go, but it gets very close to that because there is obviously uh, a very strong belief that th this attack coming from the north of Portugal is going to happen. So we come to the War of the Oranges, and I don't know what people particularly know about this, but um, I'll just go through it in very brief detail. War starts, is declared and starts uh, by the Spanish on the 6th of March at Badajoz. And basically, this is the troops involved. Uh, it's actually not that easy to find this information, actually. And I've had to get to, uh, do some work with some Portuguese and Spanish friends to get this information. But as you can see, uh, Godoy's army is about 30,000 men. Uh, in four divisions mainly, with a, a small advance guard, the Portuguese army facing him in the Alenteo is only eight and a half thousand men, uh, uh, which is not great. But there are eight thousand men in El Vash, in the actual fortress there, and a Campo Meia, which is obviously a, a, a walled city nearby. They have two thousand men as well. Um, so there are uh, nearly twenty thousand men in the vicinity for the Portuguese against the thirty thousand the Spanish are bringing into it. So on the 20th of May, the Spanish cross the border in three columns. Now, if I look at the three different columns in, in order, the first is the, the lower of the three, which marches straight towards Olivenza. Now, if you notice that bit of land there, it's a bit of an oddity because it's the one bit that sticks into Spain and it's stuck, this little bit of Portugal stuck into Spain around Olivenza has been sticking literally in the craw of, of um, Spain for centuries. They've always wanted to take it. Well, they march down there. There are very few troops in the area. The Portuguese pull out and they take Olivenza immediately. There's no difficulty about it at all. Um, an interesting thing about Olivenza, uh, oh, oh, no, I'll tell you a bit later. Sorry about that. Right. Uh, the main attack in the centre, led by Godo himself, actually attacks uh, Elvash, uh, they attempt an assault on the fortress, which proves to be very costly. And they, uh, after a bloody nose, they decide to get into a, just basically to starve them out by sort of uh, sort of sitting around there. And they sit around there for the rest of the war. In fact, not really doing an awful lot. Um, but the one thing Godoy does is he actually sends a few baskets of oranges from trees in the Elvash region. Uh, to his queen, to the queen of Spain, who is supposedly his lover as well, and basically this is how the name of the um, the War of the Oranges comes from, because it's one of the few things they managed to to actually gain. Well, it's not totally true because they did get Olivenza, um, and he then promises to march on Lisbon, uh, but he's he's in camp around El Vash and he doesn't look like he's going very far at the moment. The, the third attack, which is the top one of the three, attacks Campo Mayor. Campo Mayor, as I say, is a walled city. Really shouldn't have given up that much of a of a, uh, a defence. Uh, really, a few days of battering with guns should have seen it sort of given up. But it actually stood for 17 days. And it was the 6th of June before it, 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 it surrendered. But they took Campo Mayor. And the advance guard, the small advance guard, ad advances to, to Aronche. Uh, and on the river line there, they actually uh, meet a small Portuguese force, uh, which the uh, Spanish managed to actually defeat and drive back. And the actual uh, the Portuguese retreat even further back, as I'll show you in a minute, um, to a place called Alpahel, um, where, in fact, the British Auxiliary Army was ordered to march on the 28th of May, uh, sorry, uh, was ordered to march on the 24th of May and arrived on the 28th of May uh, in the area of, of, of Brantes. And then on the 29th, they actually joined the Portuguese army at Alpalajeo. Now, if the war had continued at this stage, you have the potential of a Spanish force attacking the uh, British and Portuguese force on the at this point. 
uh, but it then ends with um, the actual Spanish agreeing to a peace with the Portuguese. Uh, I will mention the French. The French under General Leclerc had actually started arriving at Ciudad Rodrigo. But the pa Spanish were desperate to have the war finish with a bit of success, as a success, you know, what they've seen already, um, before the French got involved. They didn't trust the French to actually leave anything to them afterwards. So the war is ended much to Napoleon's disgust before the French can get involved and actually can take any of Portugal. Uh, and the General Leclerc, Leclerc's force is actually forced to just sit there and, and uh, wait events. Now, there's, there's just a, a, an example of, you can see the long march that the British force had to make and the Portuguese re retreat back to uh, Alpa Hill where they actually met. Uh, but as I said, it's it was quite a significant move forward and could have actually uh, got British forces involved in a fight with the actual uh, Spanish, but it didn't actually ever come to that. The Spanish put, uh, stopped when they got past Porto Alegre. I should say at Porto Alegre, where I mentioned that there was a small skirmish with the Portuguese on the riverside. Uh, apparently 30 British dragoons were there. Um, there is no mention of them being involved in any fighting and there's no mention of any casualties, but they were physically at the actual place. So the, some of the British uh, forward forces had actually were as far forward as Porto Alegre. I mentioned why it was the War of the Roses as oranges, so I won't mention that again. But it's interesting what this defeat actually means to Portugal, because although they're, they're Britain's ally, they agree to close all their ports to British ships. That's both warships and merchant ships. Olivenza, uh, which they had captured, becomes Spanish. So finally, that bit of uh, that's been contested for those years. Uh, was finally given over to the, the Spanish and it, it's remained to this day. However, uh, Olivenza is is Portugal and Spain's uh, same problem as Britain and Spain with regard to Gibraltar. Uh, Portugal to this day still claim Olivenza back. Uh, Spain refused to give it back. And I don't know if it'll ever, ever change. But what is interesting is if you ever pick up a Portuguese map of the country, you will notice that when it actually has a dotted line along the, the uh, along the uh, sort of border for where Spain starts, when it gets to the Olivenza region, the actual uh, dotted line disappears. There is no line because the Portuguese still don't accept the fact that it's Spanish. Uh, the French get navigation of the Amazon, so it allows them to go over to that part of the world in the hope of actually, I mean, they weren't able to do much with it, to be honest, because of the Royal Navy, but uh, they hope to be able to exploit that in the future. And Portugal gave basically £50 million in today's money uh, to France as a, an apology, basically, for having forced them to send his troops towards them. Um, the Spanish king went to Olivenza and obviously was not well received. And uh, there's letters from him saying how how appalled he was by the uh, the fact that the the local dignitaries uh, didn't want to actually come to his ball and all the rest of it uh, because obviously they they were they still saw themselves as Portuguese, etc. Uh, but it was not until the 14th of August before the Spanish troops finally left Portugal, and it was the 24th of August before the auxiliary mm -hmm. army was finally given permission to return to Lisbon by the Portuguese. And by the following Treaty of Madrid, as you can see, uh, the, the final agreement was that a part of uh, Brazil was actually given to France and another indemnity of another 40 million was given to the French. Um, so it's quite a costly business for the Portuguese, but you've got to think suddenly, well, well we've got a Portuguese army, we've got a British army, sorry, in Portugal, and we've now, agreed for the Portuguese that they're not going to allow British ships into Portugal. Uh, how do they square that with the fact that they're still allied to us? Well, this is what Portugal does. It, it sort of basically does a delaying tactics. It hopes the peace will come soon. And in fact, they're lucky the peace of Amiens come in early 1802. 
So they de they basically delay implementing the treaty. They don't stop the Brits. They don't, uh, despite the fact that the French uh, in in Spain continually complain about the fact that the British are still in uh, Portugal. British forces are in Portugal. They don't send them home. Um, the and basically to help. Control the islands of Madeira, exactly. For example, the 85th footer landed there, and General William Clinton is given the governorship basically to hold them for the Portuguese uh, and not allow the Spanish or the French to take them. Um, so th there's there's a lot of jiggery pokery going on in the background so that they don't have to um, follow up any of the main things in the treaty until the peace comes. So in 1802, peace I mean, uh, comes. And by the June, the Auxiliary Army has left. So that is the story of the Auxiliary Army. And you think, well, maybe that's everything. So you have to, have to think, well, what happened beyond when war began again? Well, the first thing is, in 1803, as soon as war begins again, the British send Charles Stuart back to Portugal. And he makes a major report on the defences and suggests that the Auxiliary Army is sent again. Portugal says no. In 1806, as you can see, you've got three major uh, politicians, etc. James uh, Sinclair Erskine, uh, Lord Roslin, uh, General James Simcoe and Admiral Earl St. Vincent were sent out uh, to basically warn the Portuguese that Napoleon was after their fleet, like he was after the Danish fleet, as they believed, and that the, that the auxiliary army should be reinstated. Uh, Simcoe actually died before the actual ships even sailed. So Henry Brougham, the um, the politician actually who was actually a secretary there, suddenly got the job of actually doing it as well. Uh, but again, the Portuguese declined. Why did they decline? Basically because they were more afraid of a French invasion at this stage when most of the other allied countries in Europe had actually uh, been defeated by Napoleon than anything else. They, they, they just felt that allowing the auxiliary force back in would be the final straw. And by not doing so, they would actually persuade Napoleon not to attack and not to come and take their fleet, etc. Well, as you can imagine, that didn't exactly work out well for them because clearly the following year, the French invaded uh, in an attempt to take the fleet. Obviously, the fleet had left and the royal family left as well. So... That So there were attempts to continue the auxiliary army, but the Portuguese were too afraid to allow them in. And the last question is, obviously the, you've had the British forces working with the Portuguese for a six-year period. Now that actually is quite significant. And at the end of the day, the Portuguese uh, experience then, it's only six years later, that the British army arrives en masse to start the Peninsular War. So you'd think there must be some linkage that they would use a number of these officers as for experience and all the rest of it. So I started looking into it. And in fact, I've looked into it, and these are all the major officers are there. And you can see the only two that are actually mentioned uh, that have got any sort of distinction at all is uh, Cornet Bouchier, who is actually a, just an aide-de-camp, and Henry Totten's another aide-de-camp, actually so, served in the Peninsular War. All of the other senior officers in all the different areas had nothing to do with the Peninsular War at all. Um, now, the senior officers themselves, the commander-in-chiefs, are almost certainly because they'd either died or were so old they were seen as too old to get involved anymore. Uh, that's understandable. But what is less understandable is that none of these brigadiers and uh, adjutant generals and quartermaster generals and commissaries, etc., get sent out. And I find that quite incredible. The British Army starts completely again. And so therefore, Wellington, yes, he's taken his own men out there to some extent. But you just thought there would have been a backbone of people that had dealt with the Portuguese only six years previously and knew how to do things in Portugal, not a sausage. It didn't happen. And that I find quite incredible. But that is what I found out so far. I'm still working on this and I'm hoping to make a book of it in the future because I think there's a lot more to be found out if we get into the Spanish and the Portuguese archives. But thank you for that. 
Okay, thank you everyone. Fascinating conversation so far. I'm, I'm about to end our recording, but please stay online as we continue the chat. To wrap up this month's Rally Point, thank you, Gareth Glover, for joining us. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Gareth. Yeah. For those of you who have joined us live this evening, thank you for your time with us. Next time, why not join us here at the Rally Point next month when we will be catching up with uh, Dr. Stephen Summerfield. Um, simply contact Dominic or I for your Zoom invite and our details are at the end of the video and share Rally Point with your friends so we can hear from them as well. And any previous Rally Point chats are up on our YouTube channel. So if you've enjoyed this Rally Point, please leave a quick review. So it's good morning from me and it's good night from him. Good night. <laughs> uh -huh.